The patrons have spoken, and next up we have Gorbis, one of Clan Pearl's evolutions. This fish, first introduced in Generation 3's Hoenn games, is far more violent than it looks. Its pointed mouth is used for stabbing and draining its prey, which you wouldn't expect from a Pokemon whose name is partially derived from the word gorgeous. Today we're going to examine which side of the spectrum Gorbis fell on the competitive scene. Was it a gorgeous flop, or did it gore its opponents like its name suggested? And so, we ask, how good was Gorbis actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. With Stab Hydro Pump, a just good enough speed stat, and the Swift Swim ability, Gorbis had the potential for a small niche as an OU Rain Dance Sweeper, as it was much stronger than the tier's main choice for the role, Kingdra. Unfortunately, it was just barely outclassed as a Kingdra alternative by Amistar, who packed an excellent resistance to Choice Banded Double Edges and Hidden Power Flyings, had slightly better speed, and just to really rub salt in the wound, had one base special attack higher, giving it that crucial extra percentage to clean games up. Now sadly, Amistar was not exactly an OU Pokemon itself. In fact, it was one of the very best Pokemon in UU. However, this was not bad news for Gorbis. In fact, it loved partnering with Amistar. Amistar was most popular as a user of Spikes, which it could not do while also sweeping with Rain Dance. Gorbis would take advantage of the Spikes Amistar would set to ensure its targets were in KO range before it went for the late game clean. Even on teams where Gorbis remained an excellent partner, the duel's dual-pronged Rain Dance attack was often too much for teams to handle, as they could just barely survive the first, but not the second. Gorbis's pure water typing was also immensely useful in giving it setup opportunities where Amistar would falter. Sure, Amistar's resistances to normal and flying were useful, but Gorbis only being two times weak to grass was already a huge difference, whereas Amistar was one hit KO'd by even the weakest non stab hidden power grasses. Additionally crucial were Gorbis's lack of weaknesses to ground and fighting moves, given that water types are often tasked with facing off against ground types as well as many non stab earthquake users. When it came to actually dishing out the offense, yes, Gorbis was technically weaker than Amistar, but realistically, that difference was astonishingly minuscule and would likely be unnoticeable if you went only off in-battle experience. In practice, Gorbis was a terror. There was no outspeeding it once it got that rain dance off, and there were very few offensive Pokemon that it didn't effortlessly drop in one shot. Sure, if you just needed one rain dance sweeper for your team, you'd use Amistar, and thus Gorbis was pretty much always going to be paired with Amistar one way or another, but it was excellent excellent at its job. Pretty much the only time Gorbis was used without Amistar was one of its rare appearances on full Baton Pass teams, which were gimmicky and much less reliable than other forms of UU Baton Pass that hinged on consistent independent Pokemon like Scyther and Lunatone. They caused Baton Pass in its entirety to be banned from UU eventually, but this was fine since Gorbis's role in the tier was always as more of a rain dancer anyway. So all in all, Gorbis was a solid, consistently useful Pokemon in advanced UU. In addition to your regularly scheduled general power creep, Diamond and Pearl also brought with it a choice scarf and a bevy of eager, viable users, which made it easy to outrun Gorbis even once Swift Swim was activated, thanks to its pathetically low base speed. Fortunately, Gorbis can make use of some of this power creep itself. Life Orb boosted its already high special attack even further, while teammates could set Rain Dance for it more efficiently thanks to the new duration extended item, Damp Rock. Rain teams were a dominant fixture of the UU metagame, so surely Gorbis would get another shot, right? Well, kind of, but not really. Gorbis wasn't such an inherently strong Pokemon that it could survive Power Creep unscathed. It certainly did better than most Pokemon in its situation would, that's for sure, but still not well. The problem was that, as is the struggle of many water types, it had a ton of great swift swimming competition. Amistar was still around, and that would have been fine just like in the previous generation, since a rain team needs many swift swimmers, but the problem was that there were many other swimmers that also largely outclassed Gorbis. Ludicolo was now UU, and what it lacked in base special attack, it made up for with its invaluable grass stab, as well as its ability to surprise the opponent by switching over to the physical side of the spectrum with its Swords Dance set. Speaking of Swords Dance, the monstrously terrifying Kabutops established itself as likely the most dangerous Swift Swimmer around, now that the new physical special split allowed it to use Water Stab off its enormous attack stat. In a similar vein, Quillfish was quite good as well. Ludicolo, Kabutops, and Quillfish were also great because they had speed stats that allowed them to actually outrun 
run choice scarfers under rain. Now, this is not to say Gorbis had no niche. It certainly did and was seen on occasion, even on more serious teams. Its Amistar rivaling special attack stat was, of course, nothing to sneeze at. In fact, if it went with choice specs over life orb, it would be easier to play around through resist and immunities, but its rain boosted hydro pump would also gain the power to two hit Milotic and Chansey with stealth rock in play. That said, Gorbis usually went with orb as coverage was just too crucial. Indeed, Gorbis's access to psychic was particularly excellent as it allowed it to completely demolish the scourge of many a rain sweeper, Toxicroak. Now sure, Amistar could earth power Toxicroak, but it was also weak to Toxicroak's special priority vacuum wave, a weakness Gorbis was not plagued by. Psychic also made Gorbis unique among rain sweepers in that it let it blast through a similarly obnoxious roadblock, Polyrath, which Amistar could not hope to defeat reliably. Now that said, there was simply too much solid swift swimming competition for Gorbis to see consistent usage, and it thus dropped to NU. There, Gorbis was okay. Its viability was more or less tied to that of Rain Dance team's place in the metagame, and since Rain was only decent in NU, so too was Gorbis. The metagame was much harsher to them since there weren't many good Swift Swimmers, and it was easy to stifle their threat level with already popular Pokemon like Slowking, Politoed, Polyrath, and Scarf Manetric. Scarf Gardevoir tracing Swift Swim wasn't fun to face either. Sunny Day teams were the more popular weather in the tier, and their emphasis on grass types were difficult for Rain teams to handle too. Rain teams were decent, but only sometimes, on a rainy day as it were. As such, the end result was Gorbis being better in UU than it was in NU. So all in all, though Gorbis had a decent generation 4, it certainly had an interesting place and it was always in contention. Generation 5 gifted Gorbis one of the most outrageous boosting moves of all time, even to this day. None other than Shell Smash, doubling its attack, special attack, and speed, while giving it minus one defense and special defense. A flaw easily fixed with the white herb item. What made Gorbis particularly fearsome was not its capacity to use Shell Smash for its own sweeping purposes, as other Pokemon like Cloyster were doing that. No, what made Gorbis one of the most terrifying Pokemon to see in Team Preview was the fact that it could baton past these Shell smash boost off to other Pokemon. Imagine an OU special attacker, something like Latios. You're trying to counter Latios, an already difficult task, and you'd say, gee, I'm sure glad that Latios doesn't learn Nasty Plot and Agility, and I'm even more glad that it doesn't learn a move that lets it use Nasty Plot and Agility on the same turn. Well, Gorbis and its fellow Smash Pastor Huntail existed pretty much just to ensure that Latios could get that Nasty Plot and Agility combination. All it had to do was switch in safely, which was not difficult with the support of dual screens that made it easy for Gorbis to grab a Shell Smash in the first place. But wait, you'd say, what about Roar and Whirlwind? Wouldn't they put an end to the strategy? Well, let's just put aside that plenty of teams had a difficult time fitting those moves. Now, this is already a dangerous sign, but just for argument's sake, even if you had a phasing move, you were not necessarily safe against Gorbis. Number one, because turns out the Pokemon with base 114 special attack is actually pretty dangerous when giving itself a nasty plot and agility, especially when the permanent rain permeating OU both boosts its water stab and makes it even faster. And number two, even if you do have one of the rare Pokemon that withstands water and packs a phasing move, you're still not safe because one of the most common Pokemon on Smash Pass teams was Espeon, whose magic bounce ability would effortlessly turn these phasing efforts back on their users. Dragon Tail, you say? Even rarer, and Gorbis often ran substitute and had a good defense stat backed by dual screens. Smash Pass was utterly terrifying. One of the most common recipients was Needle King, who, once boosted, sliced through the tier like butter. Many players were calling for Baton Pass's ban early in the generation, partially because of full pass chains, but also very much because of Smash Pass. Gorbis having a backup in Huntail made it particularly terrifying, because if one didn't work, the other one might. It took a long, long time far too long in the eyes of many, as it didn't take place until after the generation officially ended. But Smash Pass was eventually banned from OU, and Gorbis wasn't used much outside of it. Some players recognized its ability to completely obliterate rain teams after a Shell Smash, and many teams playing against it as a Smash Passer would get rolled by it when it just attacked them outright. However, this niche was small. Gorbis was never a true OU Pokemon, as it was the definition of gimmick strategy, but it was among the scariest things you could see in an OU battle. Smash Pass was not just seen in OU 
owe you either. While Ubers generally use Smeargle for such purposes, Gorbis continued to wreak havoc in the lower tiers. Passing to Espeon absolutely destroyed the early stages of UU. Then Espeon itself was banned, and Smash Pass died down, not to be seen much after that. However, in the brief stages it was seen, pretty much everyone who faced it clamored for its ban. Espeon was not banned solely because of its role on Smash Pass, but that did play a major role. Gorbis didn't have much of a role in UU after that. Now, technically, it could shell smash on rain teams, but that was far too specific. Smash Pass's villainy was made more explicit in RU. Gorbis, with help from Smeargle, ensured that it was only a couple months before the strategy itself was banned from the tier. Black and White 2 hadn't even come out yet. Even without the phase-proof recipient of Espeon, it really was a mind-numbingly easy strategy to completely bowl the opponent over with get-up screens, use shell smash, pass it to the recipient, and win. Gorbis was a decent standalone sweeper in RU, but was mostly passed over in favor of the more consistent water type choices, of which there were many. The Smash Pass ban in RU removed the strategy from NU. Fortunately, their Gorbis was finally able to show its stuff as a genuine standalone Pokemon. It almost certainly wouldn't have been able to keep up with the tier without Shell Smash, so it's nice that Game Freak didn't pass it over, though one might argue they went too far in the opposite direction. And it's crazy what a monstrously broken boosting move will do for one's viability. Like Volcarona would probably be a career-long UU Pokemon without Quiver Dance, for example. Anyway, Gorbis still had to contend with excellent offensive water type competition, such as one of the tier's best Pokemon, Samurott, and another one of the tier's best Pokemon, Caracosta, who also used Shell Smash. Indeed, Caracosta was far and away the metagame's go-to smasher, with its excellent defensive typing, huge defense, solid rock, and even a powerful priority Aqua Jet to compensate for its low speed. However, just like its dynamic with the same type Amistar from Advanced UU, Gorbis was able to create its own niche through its different typing. Though it didn't pack the fearsome dual stab Caracosta brought to the table, Gorbis's better speed was valuable, and its special attack and base power of its stab hydro pump far outdid the power of Caracosta's attack and stab waterfall and stone edge. So all in all, Caracosta was the better Pokemon, but Gorbis was a legitimate choice. This marked the conclusion to a truly smashing generation. We're not sorry for the pun, as how many hapless low tier Pokemon have we watched get gored by the abyss? So this successful generation, however over the top, must be celebrated. Hopefully Game Freak will continue to follow in this vein with some restraint, of course. Just as quickly as Generation 5 made Gorbis one of the scariest Pokemon around in multiple tiers, so too did Generation 6 brutally cast it out. As with the addition of another comically overpowered boosting move, Geomancy, Smash Pass was no more. It fell to the wayside, making room for Geopass, which eventually resulted in tiering action that removed both it and Smash Pass. While Smeargle was having fun with this, Gorbis suffered a brutal plummet through the tiering rung. Power creep was such that even access to such an amazing boost move couldn't necessarily save it. Some players thought it would be decent in NU, but sadly that didn't last. For the third time, Gorbis was outclassed by a water rock competitor, and for the second time, that competitor also used Shell Smash. This time, it was Barbaracol that established itself as one of the tier's most dangerous Pokemon. Barbaracol outclassed Caracosta, and since the already outclassed Caracosta was still a better choice than Gorbis, well, it's not surprising that Gorbis was unable to keep up. Fortunately, the sixth generation had done a little power creeping in the tier addition department as well. Now there was a new lowest tier, PU, which Gorbis dropped to. As always, it had excellent offensive water type competition, as Floatzel was both ferocious offensively and one of the best Pokemon around, and Simipore was no slouch either. However, what they lacked was the sheer game-ending force of Shell Smash, and that's where Gorbis came in. Its only real competition as a smasher was Huntail, which was solid thanks to Sucker Punch for faster choice scarfers, but was much weaker overall, with lower attack than special attack attack and the weaker waterfall as stab. Gorbis, on the other hand, cleaned the house. Once it got its boost, things dropped. It effortlessly tore through many of the tier's common bulky Pokemon, especially if it used a Lumberry to shrug off the likes of specially defensive Clefairy's Thunder Wave and Bronzor's Toxic. Offensive Pokemon stood no chance. Sure, being outsped by common Pokemon like Scarf, Rotom Frost was irritating, but a smart Gorbis user would plan for that, given that Rotom Frost was one of the most common Pokemon in the tier. So all in all, Gorbis certainly had its flaws, but despite losing Smash Pass, it kept heart, found a new home, and continued to gore opponents.
Generation 7's PU is monstrously power crept in comparison to its Generation 6 counterpart. The stat total differences are staggering. The tier is nigh unrecognizable, and you might sense where this is going. Gorbis didn't stand a chance. Sure, the concept of a Z move on a Shell Smash Sweeper is incredible, but Gorbis also had problems like choosing between Hidden Power Grass or Water Types, or Hidden Power Fire for Ferrisseed and Abomasil, or the biggest question of all, why use it over Caracosta, which was generally far more reliable. For the first time, Gorobus couldn't find viability in any tier, and thus it dropped into untiered. And that's it! So how good was Gorobus actually? Well, there are many mono water types who lack any distinguishable characteristics beyond their cool design, and thus flounder in permanent obscurity as Game Freak refuses to give them anything to work with. Gorobus was not such a case. It started solid with decent stints in Generation 3 and 4, and was then rocketed into stardom with the addition of Generation 5 Shell Smash. Now this move would generally be considered an overcorrection even if you put it on Magikarp, and on Gorobus it was just nightmarish. Many players are across multiple Generation 5 tiers woke up screaming as they recalled their last encounter with Smash Pass. Game Freak then overcorrected their extravagant overcorrection in Generation 6 with Geomancy, and Gorbis's Smash Pass days were behind it. However, it managed to find itself a solid niche in PU. And that too didn't last, as Game Freak seems to have decided Gorbis must be punished for something they bestowed upon it. First, Smash Pass was outclassed, then PU was power crept so hard that Gorbis fell to untiered. And it still hasn't come back in Generation Eight. So here's hoping that Gorbis returns soon and perhaps with some buffs to boot. Just nothing too crazy because we already know what that looks like. Thanks for watching everyone and as always thank you so much to our patrons for voting for this Pokemon for this month's patron pick and for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know, what do you think about Competitive Gorbis? What would you give it to at least not have it be untiered? Would you give it something even more outrageous than Shell Smash? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.